Well, good morning. Um, we're glad to be worshiping with you this morning. Um, if you're new, first off, we'd like, we're really glad that you're joining us. Um, and secondly, we'd appreciate it if you'd let us know that you're here by texting the word new to the number on the screen. We'll just ask you for some contact information so we can get in touch with you. Um, if this is your first time here, uh, uh, or you've been here a while and you want to get connected, um, today after service, we are going to have this thing called Next Steps Lunch, and it's a time to meet the staff, meet other new people here, and to learn more about the church. Plus, you get a free lunch, so that's pretty good. Um, we'd love for you to take your next step and join us for that. Um, thankfully, everyone within the range of my voice um, has taken a very important step, and that's gathering with other believer believers for a specific purpose. And this gathering is much more different than going to watch people play a sport or going to a concert or even attending a class. This gathering requires everyone's participation because, it's, um, because it is to honor God and remember that his son Jesus gave up his own life to save us. It is a responsive event that requires us to celebrate these acts of love. So please join us as we continue to celebrate the great things God has done for us.
goodness and we thank you for being so good to us. We just pray that as we um, are here in this place today, we can glorify you and learn more about you. We pray that you would speak to us and to um, continue to give us your hope. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. You can have a seat. My name is Jake Dorjohn. Uh, we've been going to church here for almost four years. I help serve with uh, the children's ministry with Lynn in the fall and in the winter. And then I help lead a, a, a small group doing the walking as Jesus walk study and the discipling as Jesus disciple study. A couple of the things that I get out of it are uh, A, getting to meet new people, gotten the chance to meet, you know, seven really, really good guys uh, since we started doing this. Um, all seven of them I can call my friends, uh, truly great people that uh, at the time when we started, I didn't know if we had a whole lot in common. And then once we kind of dug into the meat of it, found out that we all had a lot of things in common, just, you know, going through life, tackling some of the same problems and raising kids and, you know, trying to trying to be good Christians and, and just learning more about how Jesus lived his life on this earth. It's, uh, you know, sometimes feel like I'm leading them, sometimes feel like we're all getting something out of it. And sometimes, you know, just kind of having a small group therapy session, if it makes any, if that makes any sense, because we're all, going through the same things, you know, sometimes different times, sometimes the same time. So it's been a really cool thing. One of the really cool things that uh, that I can say happened, it was the first group that I got to lead last year. Um, so during pandemic, we were still meeting once a week. And uh, my son decided that, uh, that he wanted to accept Christ in his life. So um, I got to baptize my son uh, here at church one Sunday morning. And then it took about, it's probably about two, three weeks. And uh, we came to church on a Sunday morning and uh, Gus Martin got to baptize Mitchell. Um, and he was one of my first group members that, uh, that we got to help lead through this. Um, and then miraculously, it was probably about a month, maybe a month and a half later, uh, Johnny Knatzer baptized two of his children. That was a really cool thing, not not just for me, but for our whole group that we could all come together and and you know share that you know share that moment together, um, where all three of us got to baptize our children in the same group session. And I I, I don't know if it gets any better than that. Um, you know, great feeling for me, and and all praise be to all praise be to God, all praise be to Jesus. You know, something I get out of it personally. Um, you know, it 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 keeps me honest and keeps me keeps me in my in the book. Um, you know, I Jerry and I joke around about it a lot. That every time I every time I go through the study, uh, I write down notes in different colored ink because every time I seem to pick up something different that I didn't pick up before, or I, I view something differently than I did the first time I went through it. And I think that that's it's just what you're going through at the time and and growth and in your Christianity and and your relationship with your relationship with God and and uh, don't really know if I can put it any differently it's just where you're at in life and and the way you're viewing things at the time um, and it, every time you could look at my book there's three different colors in there right now just because of, you know looking at something from two years back going I, I was wrong that, that, that's not how that works, but at the time, might have been right, but, uh, you know, everything changes, and, you know, I can usually relate anything that we're going through back to my family. You know, there, there's plenty of times where, you know, my, my wife and I might be, you know, might be, it ends on something, um, you know, trying to help my kids get over a hump in school or get them through something with athletics or just trying to get them through everyday life. and. It never fails, usually whatever chapter we're on, I can usually relate that back to what they're going through or what I'm going through personally. And, you know, the, the bell kind of rings and we, uh, you know, we can lay it out for them the best we can. And, uh, you know, hopefully they can get some clarity out of what I'm, out of what we're doing here and what, uh, and what, I, what I'm doing as a leader. And I'm hoping it rubs off on them. Um, I'm hoping that uh, I'm hoping one of these days that uh, they can step into some more leadership roles and 
you know, carry that on with them, you know, down the road. And, you know, I'm, I'm only hoping the example that I'm trying to give them gets them a little bit closer to Christ and gets them, uh, you know, just keeps them on the right path. about the ways that he uh, serves as a part of this community, as so many of you do in different ways. Um, and I also appreciate any way that uh, any of you can get up and, and share a part of your story in terms of how you're serving the body of Christ. And so I want to welcome you to the final part of this series called Get in the Game, where we've been using the analogy of sports to, to talk about what it means to belong to God's team and to make a contribution uh, to the cause of Christ through the uh, experience of serving, <clears throat> and the, the reason this matters so much is because we are all about the win here, and if you are a part of a team, a part of a sports team, I know it may be obvious, but one of the things that kind of has to be done from time to time is you have to clarify what the win is. Depending on what the sport is, that looks a little bit different, but in terms of church and what we are called to do on this planet, we are called to make disciples. That is the win. It's something that we talked about the very first week. And again, I know it should be obvious, but Christians and churches, for whatever reason, get caught so many times uh, focused on a lot of different activities that really does not lend themselves to the win. They just become a part of making people's lives busier and busier. And so that's why I really want us to focus on what it means to be a part of God's team and to be a part of serving in the way that he wants us to so that the church can achieve the win. And the reason that this really should matter to all of us is because it's through the experience of serving where we reach our potential. What, whatever God's potential idea is for us, we will only reach that and, <clears throat> and we will only become like Jesus through the experience of serving. And so if you're serving in any capacity here, and I know some of you are serving in a lot of different ways and maybe in more of an upfront way or maybe really behind the scenes, and that's okay because your potential is not necessarily in your skill or your area of service. Your potential is in helping someone else take their next step in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And so whether or not you are, you know, whether if you're on hospitality and you're, you know, preparing coffee and setting out communion or you are opening doors for people as a part of the welcome team, which is expanding all the time, or you're doing children's ministry or students, whatever it is, uh, in this facility or in this church or even outside the walls, of this church building, your potential is going to be seen in how you are helping someone else experience the person of Jesus through your contribution. So that's what we talked about the first couple of weeks. Last week, we talked about this idea that, that you belong to the body of Christ. And, you know, the, the Bible talks about, and Jesus talked about, and the Apostle Paul talked about the, the church being known as the bride of Christ and also the body of Christ, where we would come together in, in the different parts as God has arranged all the parts of the body and we belong to one another by making our unique contribution. And by God's design, as we come together and as we belong to the body of Christ, we become more and more like Jesus. And I said this last week and I'll say it again because it's so important. There is no path to becoming like Jesus without serving someone else or serving his cause. And so this is why we're focusing on this so much. And many of us already serve in a lot of different places. Uh, and and we, we somehow we get that in our culture that serving uh, is the right idea, that we serve because we want to make the world a better place. And so you may serve uh, somewhere in a volunteer capacity at this, you know, at, in a school system. You may serve with a local community you know, serving organization. I've done that in the past. You may be serving at a soup kitchen. Uh, you may be serving right here at MCC. But there is this expectation. Uh, maybe it's the way that you were raised, and maybe it's through your employer. I know that there's, you know, there's some companies out there that they have uh, a, a provision and expectation that they want you to go out, and they'll even make some funds uh, available for you to go out and, and to volunteer in some way. And so again, culturally, we understand this and we get this in terms of the importance and the value of serving to, in order to make the world a better place. And as important as that is for all of us, and I don't want to minimize that or take away from any of that, but as important as that is for all of us to serve in those capacities, that's not what we're talking about today. The issue is, is there's a lot of great places to serve, 
And there's a lot of great causes out there, ways that we can invest our time and sacrifice for one another. But I want to go back to the world of sports for just a minute to kind of help us catch what we're, where we're going to be going today. Not every game is, as, uh, is of equal importance in the realm of sports. A lot of it depends upon the length of the season and the, and, the, and the sport that you are involved in. For instance, you know, like if you're playing baseball, professional baseball, Major League Baseball, uh, what, what is, I don't know, the season seems to change, but there's a, you know, it seems like there's a thousand games during the season, okay? But there's 160 some games, I don't know, I may be off by that a little bit. And so you may have a streak of losing or winning seven or eight games and in the grand scheme of things, that really may not matter all that much because there's so many games that you're going to play. But you, you, but you look at football, you know, NFL, if you lose six or seven games, that could be your season because there's not nearly as many games. <clears throat> and so it depends upon the length of the season. It also depends upon, like, are you just playing some small, no-name school that you've paid so that, they, they, that you, they, they could come and play you and you could beat up on them and look good you know, on homecoming night? Is this a rival or is this kind of a no-name school and the game just doesn't matter that much? And the point is, not all games matter equally. And I want to apply that to what we talk about today. What is, the, what is unique about the service that we are called to in Christ? Because, again, I don't want to minimize where you may be serving right now in the community in some way. That's important, and I support that. We support that. You need to do that. But what is unique about the service that Christ calls us to as a part of his cause in this world? Now, we are called to be a blessing, to bless the world. That's a calling that goes all the way back to Abraham. That God's people are called to be a blessing in some way to make the world a better place, to help someone in a difficult time, uh, some kind of a challenging time in our life where we put someone else's needs above our own, but there's a higher purpose. And there's this saying that it's not whether you win or lose, but it's how you play the game that really matters. Well, that's kind of partially true because if it really didn't matter if we won or lost, then why do we keep score? However, how you play the game has a lot to do with whether or not you actually win or lose the game. And so what I want us to really focus on today, how do we play the game in such a way that we win? How do we play the game and serve the way that Jesus taught us to serve? Because it's only by serving in the way that he laid out for us and he taught us that we will actually achieve the win for God's team. Because how you play the game, the, the game determines whether you win or lose. When we serve, how we serve matters. Where we serve matters. Who we serve matters and why we serve matters. Because given the choice, if we are really honest with each other, we'd like to be able to choose where we serve. We'd love to be able to choose how we serve. Do we, do we serve in a way that's within our comfort zone? Do we serve in a time where it's convenient for us? Do we serve people that we believe are deserving of our service. And when we are serving others, are we serving in a way that it's more just like a hobby or is it a priority in our life? And if we're really honest with each other, we can ask ourselves, are we serving just because it makes us feel better about ourselves? Which we've always heard, that's a great way to serve. You just feel better about yourself. But I want us to pull away from that just a little bit so that we can see something that Jesus taught his team, his first stringers, if you will. And it's a one, a one occasion that was talked about in just one gospel where Jesus rallied his team together before he was about ready to leave the earth and he coached them up and he talked, about, talked with them and demonstrated what it means to really serve in the way that he was about to serve them. And in the most compelling and memorable way, memorable way, he reveals his game plan in a way that they would never forget and in a way that you are probably familiar with because you probably know this story. You probably heard this story. It's from John chapter 13. Nobody gets healed in this story. There's no miracles in this story. But at the same time, it's a story that we really need to remember. It connects us to the mission. It's a memorable moment. And it was a pivotal moment for his followers. It was a game-changing moment for his followers who were in the room at that time. So look with me, if you would, to John chapter 13. I'll just give you a little bit of background 
on this story. It was around the time of the Passover festival when it would have been normal for uh, the Jewish people to come together and to celebrate the Passover meal together uh, in, in a room somewhere. And Jesus' disciples had been instructed to do this, and they're in this room, and everybody's kind of waiting for something to happen. Now, one of the things that was also uh, true in that culture is that when you entered someone's house, there would normally be a servant that was a part of the, the staffing of the house. And one of the servants, unfortunately, got stuck with the job of washing other people's feet. Now, in our culture today, um, I wouldn't really like want to wash your feet, but most of you are coming in here with shoes and socks. I'm going to assume that you might have taken a shower this morning, so your feet are probably going to be pretty clean. So I think it would be an okay event. If you are in the area of Judea, Palestine, and you're in sandals and you're walking around uh, on those sandy roads and you walk in my house and you've got dirty, swe uh, sweaty feet, then if I have, you know, you know some, some of my housing staff at that point in time, somebody is going to get up and they're going to wash your feet. And it was just customary for this to be done. Everybody understood this. But again, at the same time, it was a job that nobody else wanted. And so there you have the disciples who are sitting in this room and they're waiting for this meal to start. And it doesn't really say this, but if you could just kind of imagine the scene, they're all looking around and they're like, all right, where's the foot washer at? I'm ready for this. I'm waiting. You know, somebody's going to come wash their feet because we're dirty. We're going to start the meal and they're probably sitting on the ground, which means that the food is going to be in close proximity to their feet. And at this point, it's going to be really important that somebody comes and washes everyone's feet. But at the same time, the disciples are probably looking around thinking, well, it's not my job. I'm not going to do this. There must be somebody that's, you know, a servant of this house and they're going to come and eventually this is going to happen. And so they're going to sit there and look at each other, kind of stare and wait for somebody else to get do it. But everybody else is thinking, it's not my responsibility. And so nobody's going to do it. And so it doesn't happen. So Jesus is just kind of waiting for this moment. Now, honestly, who would want to scrub the feet, the dirty feet of 12 men who have just walked into your house? Not this guy. So Jesus gets up at this moment and does something completely unexpected. John chapter 13, verses 2 through 5. It was time for supper. And the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had given him the authority over everything. <clears throat> and he had come from God and would return to God. And so he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet and drying them with the towel that he had around him. This is one of the most beautiful scenes in Scripture because there's a dichotomy happening right here. You have Jesus, the Jesus that we sing about and sing to on a Sunday morning, that we praise with praise and worship music maybe during the week, the one who we know is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus who is sovereign over everything. Nothing happens on this planet unless Jesus allows it or empowers it. All things were created through him and by him. He was the first, firstborn over all creation. I mean, he is, he is the ultimate authority and power. At the same time, in the same picture, and I think that's why you, know, you, you kind of get a little bit of that description, okay, that, that God had pretty much put all of his power in him, okay? So you get the sovereignty and the divinity of, of, of God in this picture. And at the same time, you have Jesus who takes on the role of the humble servant, the lowliest servant in the household, and begins to wash the dirty feet of his followers. And I would submit to you that it's not necessarily the foot washing at that point in time that is awkward, but who is doing it? Because even at that point in time, just like today, the world is enamored with power and greatness. The Roman Empire was all about power and greatness. It came down to property and possessions and lifestyle and, and, and houses and castles and all this kind of thing that were a part of that system. And anything to do with compassion, humility, and pity was considered weakness. Now, they didn't have the market cornered on that, though. Everybody kind of has this common understanding of power and greatness. Even God's people, Israel, going all the way back to the Old Testament, they had really a similar understanding going back to the kings of Israel. 
And, and some of the kings were very powerful. You think like King David, King Solomon, and several of the other kings, and they had this dynasty going, and they had power, and they had all of these, these, these massive armies and horses and you know, they, just military force and wealth and possessions. So, I mean, they were really no different. There is a common understanding, and we even have that today because it really comes down to a lot of the same things. When we think about greatness, it comes down to power and wealth, Who's calling the shots? Who has the most money? Who gets to make the decisions? Who has control of other people? And because of this understanding of greatness during the time of Jesus, it was probably the reason that most people missed him when he came. That the world missed him or they rejected him because Jesus did not fit their version of greatness. He didn't fit their version of power when he came down and, and he took on the, the role of a servant. He became a human being and he didn't act the way that people thought the Messiah who was going to come and, and everybody thought would conquer the Romans. He didn't fit that description. And so most people missed him as a result. So Jesus takes this nature of a servant and he, and, he, and, he, and he gets up and he wraps a towel around him and he goes around and he starts to wash the disciples' feet. And as he's doing this, you can just kind of feel it in the room. The tension is starting to build. It's like, is this really happening? They're looking at each other. And he finally gets around to the outspoken disciple. And we all know it's Peter. And, you know, he's getting ready to wash Peter's feet. And at this point, it's just too much. And Peter has to say something. Verse 6. When Jesus finally came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Translation, there is no way this is happening, okay? This is not going to happen right now. This is not right, okay? Uh, Rabbis do not wash the feet of their students, but this one is getting ready to. In Peter's mind, this is beneath Jesus. There is way too much respect for their teacher, for their rabbi, which is what would, would have been very normal during that culture. But Peter needs this whether he knows it or not. Verses 7 through 11, Jesus replied, you don't know, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands, my head as well. Lord, not just my feet. Jesus replied, a person who is only bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you, for Jesus knew who would betray him. And that's what he meant when he said, <clears throat> not all of you are clean. Effectively, Jesus is saying to Peter, with the rest of the disciples listening, What I'm about to do for you and what you are about to learn is a non-negotiable. If you are going to follow me, if you're going going to be a part of my team, if you're going to represent me to the world after I'm gone, you have to learn this. You have to embrace this. This was a game-changing moment. They had to understand what he was doing for them. It was more than just washing their feet. It was washing away any presuppositions or misunderstandings that they would have had about him and what his role was with them and also any misunderstandings about greatness. They had to leave behind everything that they had once valued and everything that they understood about what it meant to be a leader, what it meant to be in charge of a movement because they were going to be leaders and they were going to be in charge of his movement. But it all had to be under the, in this context of servanthood. And they had to understand this. This, had, this wasn't going to be just a lesson that he was going to teach and then you know, maybe not come back to you for a while. He did this in a compelling way. They were never going to. To forget. That was the object lesson. So here comes the explanation, verses 12 through 17. And after washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right because that's who I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. And I've given you an example to follow, do as I have done to you, I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. And now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. There's a couple things I want to I draw out here. First of all, great coaches coach and lead by example. They're in the place that they are only because 
they were in the place of the players at one point in time. And so they could say, I'm not just telling you to go out and do something that I've never done before, that I have no experience in. I'm coaching you to go out and follow my example and do what I did. And so he is, this is going to be a well-coached team. He is demonstrating them what they need to do. John Maxwell said, great leaders don't just point the way and show the way. Or they just don't point the way. They show the way to the people who are following them. This is exactly what Jesus is doing here. Now, the other thing, too, is Jesus is not just teaching a lesson. He's leaving a legacy. Great teams. If you think about the great teams in whatever sport that you like, they usually hearken back to this legacy, this time, this legacy, this time of tradition, where they can go back and they, and, and they remember something that a coach said, or they can remember, you know, this, 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 winning, this winning string of winning championship seasons, where there were some principles and values that they could always go back to and it doesn't matter if the culture changes it doesn't matter if the world changes we're going to go back and we're going to do things the way it was done because this is how we achieve success and it's still going to be the way that we achieve success if we can stick with these values and again Jesus is leaving them not just a lesson he's leaving them a legacy he's like you can always go back if we ever lose our way if we ever forget how the game is played, we can go back to this one occasion. You can remember what I did for you because this is the legacy that you need to be known for. It's my legacy. See, when Jesus washes the disciples' feet, he was showing them in the most unexpected way what was expected of them to be a part of the mission. And it was so important. I don't know if you caught this. this was, it was so important. Jesus was willing to to let his star player go. I don't know if you've ever had that experience or seen that in a movie or something where you got the star player, he or she has all of the skills and the, the background and they're going to you know, pretty much guarantee success for that team, but they've got the wrong attitude. The coach has to let them go. Because to keep them, even though they've got the, the greatest skills in the world, was going to be detrimental to their season. And Jesus in that moment said, Peter, if you don't get this, if you don't let me do this, if you don't embrace what it really means to be a servant, you cannot belong to me. See, we have to embrace what Jesus is teaching us here in terms of what it means to follow him and to serve like him. I mean, honestly, how many of us would have been right there with Peter? No, no, Jesus, this is just wrong. You can't do this for me because you are Jesus, you know. This is beneath you. See, when Jesus does this for Peter, what he's doing is he's saying, you have no excuse now. In any opportunity where you get to serve me, you have no excuse because I did this for you. And being a servant in this way is a non-negotiable way of life. Peter's heart needed to change. His thinking needed to change. And Jesus taught him and all of us that servanthood is the quickest and most effective route to change. And it's the best way to open someone's heart to a new way of thinking. The best way to touch someone's heart is to wash their feet. Now, not literally, because that would be like really awkward now. But to get to that level. To serve someone in such a game-changing way that they cannot help but become curious about why are you doing this? Who do you represent? What is your inner motivation that you would do this? You see, it's one thing to understand what it means to serve. It's another when the greatest person in the room is the one serving you. And simply, Jesus is saying to all of his disciples and all of us and anyone who would ever follow him, he's like, this is what you have to be known for. Forget everything else because nothing else matters. If you don't get this, there's nothing else that we would ever do that matters. It doesn't matter if we would gather in this room with 10,000 people. If this is all we did, we were just known for being a big church or a growing church, and we just gathered and we had a lot of fun on a Sunday morning. If we didn't leave this place and go out and serve other people like Jesus, none of this would matter at all. So we've got to embrace this. This has to be what we are known for, which means we have to put the team first. 
We have to give up what matters to us. We have to give up any ideas of becoming who we wanted to be. And in some cases, we have to give up the dreams that we had for ourselves if they're motivated from a point of selfish ambition. We have to give up our version of greatness and success. If not, serving will only rise to the level of a hobby. Serving will only be that thing that we do when everything else is already completed and then God just gets the leftovers. Now let me ask you, especially for you coaches in the room, how many of you would leave a player on your team if that's the attitude that they came into your team with? You'd kick them off or you'd cut them because you have a higher expectation than that. Why can't Jesus have the same expectation of his team? We cannot hold on to the world's version of success and also hold on to, uh, to Jesus' definition at the same time because they are incompatible. So serving is a way to make the world a better place. And we need to do that. But the right and true motivation for serving is not just to make the world a better place. It's to help someone else understand more about who Jesus is. For the world to know what Jesus is really like you and I, we as his team, we have to be willing to serve like Jesus. Let me ask this question. What if it's possible someone could come to understand who Jesus is because you were willing to stoop down and wash their feet? You were willing to do something in a game-changing way for them that they would have never understood. I'll share one instance where that happened to us. I was really scared when our oldest son at that time got diagnosed with cancer. Didn't know what was going to do. Knew he had to go through chemotherapy. And you know the thing that bugged me at that point in time, and I know you're going to think this is silly. The thing that really bugged me at this point in time is, at that point in time, is he was going to lose his hair. And it's not like he had this long flowing hair or anything. It wasn't like that. It was just like, you know, you're watching your eight-year-old kid go bald. And I was like, I don't know if I can handle that. And I, for whatever reason, that was the thing that was really bothered me. And it even bothered me more than when the doctor came in the room at one point and they said, you know, he's never going to be able to play sports. Uh, th that was one of the moments where I actually cried, and I was even a little bit embarrassed to say that because I was like, wow, that's, they're really taking a lot away from him, but he could never play contact sports. And he was really good at soccer. But this whole idea of him losing his hair is like, that's a lot, that's a lot to handle. One day I get a phone call from one of our good friends, and he said, hey, he goes, he goes I want to come over. He goes, I, 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 I want to do something. I think you guys are really going to have fun. His name is Brian. He's a firefighter, landscaper. He came over, and he said, I want to let your son cut all my hair off. I was like, you would, you would do that? And we still have pictures from that day. He came over. He sat down. And he said, I'm going to cut your hair. You're going to cut my hair. And that was such a beautiful moment. That was a game changer for me. That one experience taught me more about servanthood. As you can tell, it still, it still um, means something to me. Are you willing, in the same way, to create a game-changing moment for someone else because you would do something that is completely unexpected? Because you understood what Jesus did for you. When you understand that Jesus, the most powerful person in the world, came in and he took the form of the lowliest servant to wash your feet so that you would trust him enough to let him wash your sins away. It only makes sense that we would serve like Jesus so someone could understand that he could do the same for them. And that is the way that I want to encourage you today that maybe for the first time you would be willing to leave a legacy by picking up a towel the way that Jesus did with his disciples and serve someone else just like Jesus and understand this was always, always Jesus' plan for how his people would change the world. Would you do this? That's what it means to be called to serve the cause of Christ today.
And that's what will cause someone else to become curious about the faith that you have. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be the hands and the feet of Jesus and to understand that being a servant is not just what we do, it's who we are. It's who we need to be to serve someone in a game-changing way. And that means that sometimes we understand we can't pick and choose the person or the time or the way. We just have to embrace the opportunity when it comes on to us, that it has to be a priority, that it has to be something that is motivated with the understanding that Jesus has already done this for us. We can never outserve him. The only thing that we can do is we can honor him through living like him and serving like him, that the world may come to believe the Jesus that they see in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand now and continue to worship.
that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You can have a seat. Jesus has cleared the path for us to be reunited with God and restored our very broken relationship with him. It's through Jesus' death and resurrection that our sins and mistakes have been wiped clean and allowed us to have freedom from them. So we're going to take a few moments to focus on remembering how we have been saved by taking communion. If you haven't already, now's a good time to grab one of those personal communion cups from the back. Uh, And in those cups, there's a small cracker that symbolizes Jesus' body that was beaten, broken, and put on a cross. There's also some juice that represents his blood that was spilled to save us from our sins. Whenever you're ready, you can take that cracker, but we will wait to take the juice all together and remember that we are all united as one body in Christ. take the juice now. It's one body in Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your son. We thank you for sending him to this earth to save us. We can't imagine the sacrifice that you made to do that. And we just thank you so dearly for it. We pray this in your son's name. As we continue to worship, we have an opportunity to give back a piece of what God has given us. This time of offering happens because God first gave to us. Everything that we have came from him. So if we give with our minds focusing on this, our hearts will be focused on worshiping God through these acts. So the ways you can give, you can either drop your gift in the plates in the back, you can scan the QR codes there, or you can text your amount to 84321, or you can give online on our website. So let's pray for the offering. God, we thank you for these gifts. We pray that they are just used in your will, and that uh, you would just guide the hands that uh, hold them, and that they would uh, just grow your kingdom and help others uh, come to know you better pray that you would guide us this week as we go about our lives and just uh, pray that we can always serve you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.